Hi, I'm New York Times Metro reporter Jeff May sitting in for Sam Roberts. This week, federal government responds to a productive but controversial approach to the fentanyl epidemic. Two prevention centers are at risk of being shut down. We'll hear from a Times reporter covering the story. But before that, news broke this week revealing that Governor Andrew Cuomo's sister, Madeline, was pulling the strings behind public campaigns to smear multiple women, accusing the former governor of sexual misconduct, allegations that eventually led to his resignation. Internal communications between the activist group defending the governor and Ms. Cuomo seemed to indicate that he was aware of the coordinated effort. Joining me now to discuss the emerging scandal is Metro Desk reporter Nicholas Fandos, who recently brought the cover up to light. Thanks for joining us, Nick. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Um, so I'm wondering, what exactly was being posted on these online forums? Yeah, so uh, just to give a little bit of the arc of the story, um, when women came out and began to accuse Andrew Cuomo of sexual misconduct in the spring of 2021, uh, these groups started forming on Facebook and on Twitter of women posting, kind of going after media accounts that they thought were one-sided, trying to dig into the backgrounds or see if they could find holes in the stories from his accusers. But what my story showed is that over time, Madeline Cuomo, his sister, was pushing them to make kind of ever more aggressive um, posts about some of these women. So in some cases, uh, posting photographs, uh, private photographs uh, of one of the accusers, Charlotte Bennett, that uh, made her look, let's say, less than professional. Um, and was uh, Madeline Cuomo called them bimbo photos to give you an idea, and they were posted with some menacing language. Um, other things kind of trying to threaten uh, Lindsey Boylan or Karen Hinton, other women who had accused the governor um, into being quiet, uh, things about their past, um, innuendo about you know their conduct that didn't seem to necessarily based on information she had, but was was meant to kind of make these women look untrustworthy. Uh, uncredible and so forth and was and was pretty uh, pretty much might be called a smear and who who are these women the group was called we decide New York who exactly are the women that made this group up yeah so we decide New York was one of the kind of best organized of several groups doing this work and they're mostly women in their 50s 60s 70s they're Democrats almost all of them that I've talked to tell a similar story where they were not super politically involved but during the pandemic they were stuck at home there was a vacuum of leadership as they saw it coming from the White House in Washington. And Andrew Cuomo was the one filling that, the one every day they were watching his briefings, which we all remember. Uh, and, you know, um, he felt like the person standing between them and like this crisis really going off the rails. So when people come out and start accusing him, they basically felt like something is off here. This guy is too powerful a leader. These accusations don't make sense to us. They thought he was being railroaded. Right. So everybody remembers that period, right? There was a high prominence for right. the governor, a lot of attention, a lot of praise going on. Um, and so looking at your reporting, you were your great reporting. You were able to access about 4000 text messages, voice messages. How did you uh, get a hold of that group? Uh, and what was the process of communicating? Yeah. You know? So I had actually written about this group once before. And at the time, they told me that there was no coordination whatsoever or contact with the Cuomo family or Cuomo aides. It turns out now they've admitted to me that that was a lie. They'd been asked to, to lie to me by Madeline Cuomo. Um, so th these women who, who ran this group, We Decide New York, had a big falling out with Madeline uh, last fall uh, and feel basically that she turned on them and tried to, you know, tried to ruin their reputations and so on and so forth. So they came forward and were willing to tell their story on the record. And they said, by the way, you know, we have basically two years worth of emails, text messages, voice memos that demonstrate her intense involvement, which she was eager to conceal. I mean, she told them many times in these texts, you've got to delete this. I've got to stay behind the scenes. People will say, I'm putting, up, putting you up to it if, uh, if it gets out. And how, how did this work? Did Madeline just tell the group what to write online? Was there, were there strategy sessions? How did they decide what to post? You know, there was some symbiosis. Like, I think it's worth pointing out that you know, these at the in the beginning, they had kind of a shared cause, and I think they were very eager to hear from Madeline Cuomo, the sister of the person they're working so hard to defend. So it starts out with her giving feedback on, I don't know that I'd post that. You should word it this way. Let me take a look at that and edit it. And over time, I think she becomes more assertive, and there's kind of long text and email threads and conversations that happened over the phone um, where she is kind of coaching about the best way to to go. 
uh, about a, either attacking these women or supporting her brother. I mean, at one point, she's trying to get the women to line up to carry petitions to get him on the ballot when he might have run for, for a comeback and didn't end up playing out. And the, the Cuomo family, we know they, they are one of the most storied political families Right. Uh, in the country, w was this effort just designed to protect uh, their reputation, their name? Well, so when we went to Madeleine Cuomo for comment about this, she basically said, look, this is my brother. I felt he was falsely accused and I was going to do anything I could to try and help him. But the really interesting question at the heart of this, I think, is what was Andrew Cuomo's involvement in this? He's somebody who, when he was governor, was intensely focused on his his image and um, you know how people spoke about him since he's left office he's been intensely focused on trying to clear his name um, and scattered throughout these messages are probably dozens of references that Madeline makes to I was just speaking to my brother he's seeing everything you're doing Andrew wants us to post this they sent us a list of these questions to put out she's very clearly stating and giving the impression anyway that he's watching and the one kind of behind the scenes now, again, when we went to publish the story, both she and he denied that he had had any direct involvement. Uh, but the contemporaneous messages uh, point to something different, and I think readers can, can look at that and, and form their own judgment. Right. And the governor, we know the governor uh, is, has always been a hands-on sort of person. Exactly. Um, but in terms of actually crafting that message, is, you've covered him for a while. Does this, does this fit in with his mode of operation? or? I mean, I, I think that uh, Andrew Cuomo is known as someone, as you say, who is super hands-on and is a, uh, shall we say, creative uh, political tactician who is willing to kind of set things in motion that will have an effect, but maybe you can't see his hand in them. So, you know, I think it's quite plausible that this would fit with a pattern of behavior that his, both his friends and his enemies have suspected uh, for years, he has some plausible deniability. There are no messages that show him directly communicating with these women, uh, but you know there's certainly a fair amount of smoke, um, you know, uh, surrounding whether there's a fire there or not. Right. We'll see if we can get any more information to. Were, were you able to determine at all whether the work of this group had any effect on public opinion? It's such a good question because you know. In all fairness, we're talking about a pretty small group of people, social media following. I mean, some of the biggest accounts have a few thousand followers. Um, obviously, Andrew Cuomo has not been able to make a political comeback. Um, he ha is out of office without a platform. But I think that there was a real symbolic weight to what these women were doing. They got a lot of media attention. They got a lot of attention, frankly, from um, his office, even publicly, because all of his traditional allies were walking away from him at this point that he was being accused. Nobody was standing up for him. And this was a group standing by him. And powerfully, they were, they were women saying, we're not sure that this, either these actions constitute sexual harassment or that we believe them. Um, and I think that that was a pretty um, powerful, but perhaps mostly symbolic uh, kind of fact for him. And I mean, my last question on this, th these were very serious allegations against the governor of sexual harassment and uh, the, the online posts uh, were smearing some of the women, as you mentioned earlier. What, what do these women who were smeared in these online posts, some of them who had made sexual uh, allegations against the governor, what, what did they say about this? Yeah, well, it's been interesting. Several of them uh, say they are, you know, not surprised uh, to see this happen, that they or to see this reporting come forth because they felt like this campaign was being coordinated in some way against them. Um, but I think it's worth noting that, that um, two of the women uh, who have accused the governor and were included in the attorney general's report that ultimately prompted his resignation have ongoing lawsuits against him. And one of those cases involving Charlotte Bennett, her lawyer has told me that she's going to now seek to depose uh, Madeline Cuomo and potentially some of the women involved in this uh, in this group and try and get these records and thinks that that could be relevant to their case. We'll see if a, if a judge agrees and lets that go forward, but it could be a pretty interesting avenue of further uh, exploration and discovery in this. Has anyone filed any uh, defamation suits uh, yet? At this point, uh, at this point, no. Okay, great. Uh, we have a few minutes left. I just want to talk to you about a story that we worked on together not yeah. long ago with our colleague uh, Emma Fitzsimmons. Uh, we wrote about a meeting of a group of progressives mm -hmm. uh, on Staten Island, of all places. Uh, they got together and, and they wanted to brainstorm uh, the possibilities for people to run for the next mayor. Um, Eric Adams is still a pretty strong mayor. Tell me, what's, what's going on that you have these progressives who are already starting? Yeah, to well, I think that 
both of us and Emma have been hearing right for for quite a while that there's a lot of dissatisfaction with the mayor, um, certainly among progressives and groups on the left, but certain different ideological pockets too. And people already trying to think ahead, like how do we challenge him in 2025? Can there be a viable primary? It's really hard to take on an incumbent in New York, um, but you know, could the conditions be right? And so it's been a lot of talk and, I, and we found out about this meeting that happened, yeah, on Staten Island at somebody's house but it brought in a lot of Manhattanites and Brooklynites and right. folks from other boroughs, I would imagine, uh, which seemed to be one of the first moments where these people were coming together and they asked an elected official who they were hoping maybe could be their candidate, Antonio Reynoso, the Brooklyn borough president, to come and meet with them. Um, so it struck us, I think, tell me if you disagree, as, as kind of a, uh, maybe a new phase in this, in this um, quest to find somebody to take on Eric Adams, although the success of that obviously is very much up in the air. Well, M Mr. Reynoso said he was not interested. He made it right. very clear. Uh, who were the other people that uh, they were? This group is thinking could possibly challenge Eric Adams. Yeah, I mean the other names that that I think we're hearing, uh, they were not necessarily at this meeting, but um, Jessica Ramos, who's a state senator, um, you know, said to be thinking about it. Zelnor Myrie, another state senator from Brooklyn. Um, Jamal Bowman, who's the congressman from, he represents parts of uh, Westchester and a little bit of the Bronx. He now lives outside the city, so he'd probably have to move back if he was going to run, but his name keeps uh, getting bandied about. Others you hear, Catherine Garcia, who obviously ran uh, against Adams and, and narrowly lost uh, in 2021. Um, I'm trying to think who I'm leaving out. We're at the stage where there's lots of names, lots of people thinking about it, but we'll see if they start to take concrete steps. You mentioned the sort of dissatisfaction with the mayor. What exactly, there's a lot going on in the city. Yeah. What are they unhappy about? I think, that it's a, I think that it's a range of things. So I think that the left is, is dissatisfied with the way he's handled policing, the way he's handling the migrant crisis, um, social services like you know, proposed cuts to libraries and schools and things like that. And just feel like New York City, the liberal metropolis, ought to have a more liberal mayor, frankly. But I think the thing that, that we've got to watch and it's going to be interesting is there are, there are pockets of people who maybe are not quite that far left but feel basically that the mayor has not put together an administration that's fully staffed, that's fully competent, that isn't kind of professionally running the city uh, in the way that they think it should be or that some other leader might be able to. And if that dissatisfaction, you know, grows and spreads and begins to eat into some of his base of support, uh, then things could potentially get interesting. We're 18 months into the mayor's term. Is he worried about this already? Is this something uh, that his advisors or, or that he's concerned about? Clearly they're thinking about it. I mean, he's stockpiling a lot of money, uh, which will help him. Uh, and they seem, um, you know, qu quite animated, shall we say, about uh, the possibility of challengers. Now, whether he actually feels threatened or at risk, I don't know. As I say, an incumbent mayor of New York tends to get the support of all the labor unions. He's put together a lot of money. Um, you know, it's hard to take out an incumbent. Um, so I think he's probably got to be happy with where he's sitting. Uh, and knowing Eric Adams, who does not take, uh, you know, much talk from anybody who's criticizing him, my guess is the more people are open about challenging him, the more he's going to go, uh, he's going to go punch back. We still have some time left. We'll see what happens. Thanks for joining us, Nick. I appreciate it. Coming up, two New York City overdose prevention centers in Manhattan come under threat of being closed down. In 2021, as the fentanyl epidemic was taking hold of the city, a controversial new approach to overdose deaths Letting addicts use illegal and dangerous drugs under supervision was deployed in East Harlem and Washington Heights. They are the only two of its kind to operate publicly in the country. According to the nonprofit that runs the centers, On Point New York City, the program has been a success. But according to the Southern District of New York, they are illegal under federal law. New York Times health reporter Sharon Otterman is here to discuss a reporting on whether the approach is working, and if so, what needs to be done to protect it. Thanks for joining us, Sharon. I really appreciate it. Thanks so much. So let's start off a little bit. Talk a little bit about what's happening with fentanyl use in New York City and overdose deaths. 
So as with much of the country, we're in the middle of an overdose epidemic. Uh, the numbers have just been going up and up. Uh, the last numbers that we have are from 2021, and there was about 2,700 deaths in New York City, and that works out to a death about every three or four hours. So you can see why we consider it a public health crisis. And, and how long has One Point uh, been operating? So it's called On Point. Oh, On that's Point. Okay. okay yeah. uh, it's called On Point. And actually, On Point is an organization that's been around for about seven or eight years. But they only opened the supervised consumption sites in 2021. They offer a lot more than just a room where you can inject or smoke your drugs. You can also get medical care there. You can get uh, attached or connected to detox if you want. Um, there's even acupuncture. There's massage. Uh, and they're very open. You know, you can go. They, they love to have people come in and take a look. Do they, they don't provide the illegal drugs that their clients use? No. So the way that it works is clients bring in their illegal drugs. Uh, they sign in. They write down what they'll be using. So if you're using crack, you write down crack. If you're using heroin, you write down heroin. You come into the back room. There are about a dozen booths where they'll watch you inject. And then there's a room in the back where you can smoke drugs too. And this has often been a, a controversial, some people consider it radical approach. Um, given the uh, amount of overdose deaths, is that what people feel is necessary at this point to deal with the crisis? Yeah, people are trying all kinds of ways to deal with this crisis. Uh, definitely everyone sort of agrees that what's been happening is not working. So this is a method that's been tried in Europe. It's going on in Canada. But because it does violate federal and some state laws. It hasn't really been tried in the United States openly. So it was Mayor de Blasio before he left that basically wrote a note authorizing as an executive action the, this organization to open these sites. And what's happening at On Point? Is, is this sort of radical approach? Is it working? Is it preventing overdose deaths? Yeah, not only has there not been an overdose death at On Point, there's never been a recorded overdose death at any of the supervised consumption sites that operate around the world. The reason is that they are watching you extremely closely as you do your drugs. And as soon as they notice a color change, they even have uh, an oxygen meter, like uh, we know from COVID, they put on your finger. Um, they're able to intervene with oxygen and get, and get that person through the worst of the overdose. And they can also inject naloxone or use Narcan um, to bring people back. So going back, Mayor de Blasio sort of authorized the center to operate in 2021. It's now 2023. Um, why is the U.S. attorney taking such a hard stance uh, on, a, on a center that's been operating for a couple of years now? You know, we really don't know the answer to that. I was surprised when the statement came in and it was as strong as it was. And the statement was, if there's not a change in federal, state or local law in short order, then I reserve the right to enforce the law. And right now, these are functioning illegally, and, and that's not acceptable. Uh, and so, I mean, he is stating the law, you know, as it stands in their interpretation. Um, people who are in favor of supervised injection sites say that they don't believe they're breaking the law. They think that the crack house statute, which is the main law that they're breaking, which makes it illegal to facilitate the consumption of drugs on your property does not apply to them because they're not drug dealers operating a crack house. They are nonprofit workers trying to save people's lives. So they have arguments that they don't believe that they are breaking the law. Um, I think the U.S. attorney is saying we can't just open this without lawmakers being involved, without policymakers involved. We have to come to a consensus as a city, maybe even as a nation, that we're going to allow these centers to function, even on a pilot or experimental basis. What's been the Biden administration's approach? Because certainly, uh, I remember some reporting I did with my colleague Andy Newman uh, back in 21, uh, the federal government basically, you know, had taken a sort of approach that they wanted to sort of help end overdose deaths. So what, where does the Biden administration stand on this? So the entire philosophy uh, behind this program is called harm reduction. And harm reduction, um, even in the broader picture, does remain controversial. In that sense, um, the Biden administration was the, is the first presidency that's even said okay to harm reduction as a concept. 
So they are providing, providing millions of dollars of funding to something like a syringe exchange program, which was extremely radical when it was started 20 or 30 years ago, actually in the Bronx. And now people accept that syringe exchanges are a way to reduce HIV and other um, you know, extremely dangerous uh, outcomes that you can get from um, intravenous drug use. So because they were supporting harm reduction as a concept, uh, the assumption was that they were going to kind of take a wait and see approach to this center. They definitely knew it's, it was operating. This uh, idea that Williams is saying in short order, this has to change. I was surprised by that as much as they were surprised by that. Right. Yeah. And so he's threatened potential legal action. Uh, but there's another case that's going on in Philadelphia, right? That's been going on since 2019 with a similar yeah. center. Yeah. That's a similar case. Um, that, in that case, uh, Safe House, which is what the place in Philly called, never actually opened. The Trump administration sued to stop them from opening, and they've been in legal battles ever since. I think the harm reduction folk um, really wanted the Biden administration to kind of let that litigation drop, and they haven't. The, so the Justice Department is continuing um, that litigation. So that was a signal um, to the harm reduction community that maybe the Biden administration is not um, quite as friendly towards this approach without some legislative action um, as they expected. Now, these uh, centers, you talked about the crack house statute, but isn't a place like uh, On Point, don't they receive city funding as well? Are they operating with city, state, and federal funding? So they have a lot of programs going on in there. So the syringe exchange, the medical care, um, the, so the social workers, um, those people may well be getting uh, city, state, and even federal funding for some of those programs. But the actual room where they're injecting or smoking drugs, they say, is only funded by private funds. And when I asked who's funding it, it's often people who lost someone to an overdose who realize, you know, how important this is that people don't die accidentally from doing street drugs. And are, are there have been a lot of uh, settlements against opioid makers recently. Is any of the funding funneling into uh, centers like On Point? So there's about 2.6 billion dollars that's been recovered um, from opioid makers and distributors. Uh, and uh, Governor Kathy Hochul set up a advisory board to advise her where to send the money. Um, the advisory board did say that supervised consumption sites were a good idea, but she has declined to invest in them. And if you ask her office why, they'll say, because of this legal issue. Yeah, they they are worried that it falls afoul of state and federal law, and they are looking to the legislature to act. And when you talk to local leaders in East Harlem, I'm, I'm wondering, they, they've complained for a long time about drug use um, in their community. How do they feel about this center? It feels like they, there may be some mixed views on, on its operation. Yeah, I'd say that views are mixed. I did not uh, talk to every elected official, so I, I don't know exactly how everyone comes down on it. But there are people in the community who are absolutely certain that this center is facilitating um, drug use in the area because it's not open all the time and people are buying their drugs outside and then using the drugs inside. Um, there are other people who say, you know what, this is much better than people overdosing in parks or using in parks uh, and street corners. And so the problem is not that on point is there. The problem is that there's drug activity there and on point is actually a facilitating safer use. So I think what people are upset about is just the prevalence of drug activity in the neighborhood. Um, not as much that on point is saving lives in an inside room. Has there been any noticeable change in the neighborhood in terms of activity since on point began operating? Um, I have not done the reporting, but I know that people are mixed. Some people say, like the On Point itself says, we are operating here because the drug dealers were already here. And then other people in the neighborhood will say, I've lived here 20 years and I think there's more. So I do not have the research to know who is right. I'm looking forward to learning more about that. Um, I'm looking forward to talking to the NYPD about what they are noticing. Um, but it's controversial. And I think one of the things here is that, you know, when you put out a sidewalk cafe, right, when you give a liquor license, there is a community hearing. I think one of the things that people in the community are asking for is that because this 
didn't, doesn't have a legal process, nobody asked them. No, there was no community hearing. There was no community impact process. And they want that. They want that. Right. Um, given uh, that the uh, U.S. attorney has said this is an illegal activity, are, are there efforts now in the state to pass laws that would allow places like On Point to operate within the law? Yeah, um, there's both a Senate and an Assembly bill that would that are trying to um, legalize these to the extent that they can. Um, and you know, the way to legalize it, and this has already been done in Rhode Island, is that they say this is a pilot program for research purposes and to help people survive the opioid epidemic. And we're granting this exception, uh, not that anyone can run a crack house, but that if you are an organization that has other harm reduction in place, um, like syringe exchange, like other services to get you into detox or treatment, um, and if the community agrees, then you can open. Right. And so they're trying to set up a legislative process. Um, they've been trying to pass this for a couple years now, and no luck yet. But um, the people who support it have been touring to just, it's very moving when you go in and you watch them save lives. Does On Point have any intention of stopping, given the U.S. Attorney's warning? Are they still going to continue to help people uh, use drugs? I think everyone is continuing. Um, the city remains supportive. Um, the city, in a statement, they said, we remain supportive, but we also want some, you know, we also wait, await clarity on this from uh, state and federal lawmakers. So I think the holding pattern is going to stay. And... I guess we're going to be watching to see what the U.S. attorney does, if anything. Right. Now, you visited On Point. What, what did you see there? I mean, it's, it's such a unique thing to see the setup where people are being, you know, illegal drug use is actually being facilitated for people. Yeah. Um, you know, Sam Rivera, who's the On Point executive director, he says it's a place of love. I think that's the, the clearest way that you can think about it, because when you go in there, um, you know, nobody is asking questions. Nobody wants anyone to feel uncomfortable. It's everyone who comes as they are. If you want to, you know, go into the back and inject your drugs, um, that's fine. They're going to actually tie off your arm with a tourniquet or help you, uh, you know, melt your crack into cocaine. They'll give you, they'll give you citric acid because it's better uh, facilitator to create the injection. Um, they'll give you a needle. So um, you can see why people would say this is facilitating. They say, there's people are doing this anyway. We're making them safe. And the level of gratitude from the drug users who, you know, some people say, oh, these drug users, if they value their life, they wouldn't be doing this. Well, these people have an addiction and they're there because they value their life. You actually met one of the users mm -hmm. there, Eddie M. Tell me, tell me a little bit about his story. So Eddie M, I actually took a walk with him after. Um, he is 69 years old. He's been a drug user for years. Uh, he used to use in hallways or parks. Um, he is in Brooklyn right now. I'm not, I don't think he's in permanent housing, but he's living in Brooklyn. He's from the neighborhood originally. And he comes in usually twice a day to inject his drugs under supervision. Um, and he is just so grateful. They have brought him back from overdose a couple of times. And they've also taught him how to use safer. So when he was talking about his overdoses, he said, you know, it's been, a, it's been a couple months now. And they're like, yeah, it's been a little while. So he's sort of proud that he is learning how to do this safely. Now, will he go into treatment one day? That is the hope, but nobody is pushing him. You know, they want it to come from him. And I think people who work with um, people with substance use disorders, you know, they know it has to come from you. Uh, to really enter the treatment. Wow. Thanks so much for this important reporting, Sharon. I look forward to your future stories on this. Thank you so much. Well, that's it for today's show. Thanks for joining us. I'm Jeff Mays, filling in for Sam Roberts. See you again next week on CUNY TV.